continue our discussion by looking at the neuromuscular junction. Now think about what we're looking at with the neuromuscular junction. This is where your nervous system and your muscular system meet, where a neuron and a muscle cell meet. So right over here in this picture, you can see where you're getting towards the end of an axon where it splits out into all these little branches called presynaptic terminals. So there you can see sort of a little bundle of them right here at the end of this axon. Let's also mention something called the synapse. Now the synapse, synaptic cleft, synaptic space, whatever they want to call it, is the space where these two cells meet. There'd be a tiny little gap in between them. So looking down here at the bottom, if you look at pre, right before the synapse, the presynaptic terminal, that's the end of that axon. And at the end of that axon, there's lots of little vesicles with particular chemicals in them. We're going to look at one especially called acetylcholine here. The synaptic cleft, again, is the space in between the end of that axon and the skeletal muscle cell. And then the postsynaptic membrane is going to be the surface of the skeletal muscle cell itself. So look at the function of this neuromuscular junction. We've got the junction between the end of an axon coming off a motor neuron and the beginning of a muscle cell. So looking at these neurotransmitters, there are lots of them in the body, brain, interaction with muscular system, whatever, for many different functions. Some are stimulatory, some are inhibitory. But we're going to look at a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine being released into the synapse when you want a neuron to tell a muscle cell to contract. But there's another chemical in there too, an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that we'll see breaks down acetylcholine. If you want a muscle to relax, that material is going to have to be there. So look at what all is happening at this neuromuscular junction. First of all, you got an action potential moving down an axon. We looked at that in the previous video. When it gets down close to the end of this axon, it's going to open up many voltage-gated calcium channels. Now remember, the cell likes to keep calcium primarily on the outside of the cell. So if you open up the calcium channel gates, calcium is going to come in to that presynaptic membrane. Again, pre is before the synapse. We're at the end of the axon here. Now as that calcium comes into that presynaptic membrane, that is going to cause the release of acetylcholine into that synapse. It's just an example of exocytosis, moving something out of the cell. Number three, we've got acetylcholine diffusing across the synapse. So the influx of that calcium into that presynaptic membrane caused the release of acetylcholine into the synapse, and it just simply diffuses from an area of high to low concentration across the synapse, reaching the postsynaptic membrane at the skeletal muscle cell membrane. Now, once that acetylcholine gets down to the cell membrane of that skeletal muscle cell, it's going to bind to the ligand-gated sodium channels. And when it does, it's going to open them up. <clears throat> Remember, the cell likes to keep most of the sodium on the outside. So if you open up sodium channels, the sodium is going to come pouring into that skeletal muscle cell. When it does, enough positive ion coming into that cell will cause a depolarization, the swapping of those charges. And remember, that is what generates an action potential and electric signal. And all that's going to cause the muscle contraction to occur. We'll look at what's going on more inside the muscle cell a little further along. But also back in that synapse, don't forget you've got this enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, removing the acetylcholine. So once that acetylcholine binds to those sodium channels, this enzyme is going to break it down and remove it from those sodium channels. When it does, the sodium channels close, the sodium is pumped back out of the cell, repolarizing the cell. But when that acetylcholine is broken down, it's broken down into choline and acetic acid. Now the acetic acid will diffuse out of this synapse. The choline will be taken back up into the presynaptic terminal. In other words, back up into the end of the axon, and it's recycled and reused to make more acetylcholine. So all those steps are shown right here. And look at these little pictures right here. Imagine you've got an action potential coming down an axon. Once it gets down close to the end of it, opens up the voltage-gated channels. Calcium pours in to the end of this axon. That causes these vesicles of acetylcholine to move into that synapse. The acetylcholine will diffuse across the synapse. 
And anytime it reaches a ligand gated sodium channel, it'll open up the gates and let the sodium in, generating an electric signal, which again is an action potential. Now look inside of the muscle. We just saw we had an electric signal generated on that cell membrane of that muscle. Now we look at what's called excitation contraction coupling. This is the mechanism where an action potential causes this muscle cell to contract. So what happens when that electric signal, that action potential is generated across the surface of the membrane of that skeletal muscle cell? It's going to reach these structures on the cell membrane called T-tubules. And what these are are places where the cell membrane of that muscle cell go deeper into the cell. That's going to bring that electric signal deeper inside that skeletal muscle cell. When that action potential comes deeper to the inside, it's going to pass along these terminal cisterna, which are enlarged areas of sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, in a muscle cell, what that is, is smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And one of the functions of smooth endoplasmic reticulum is storing calcium. Those little endoplasmic reticulum have got voltage-gated calcium channels. So when that sarcolemma and that T-tubule brings that electric signal deeper, it's going to cause those voltage-gated calcium channels on that smooth endoplasmic reticulum to open. That's going to cause the release of calcium. Calcium will bind to the protein troponin. One of its three little parts or subunits is there for calcium to bind to. When it binds, that calcium binds to that troponin, that'll cause that fiber called the tropomycin thread to move. And that will expose the active sites on the actin myofilaments. When that happens, the myosin myofilaments will bind to the actin. That's what's called cross bridge formation. And at the hinge region of that myosin, ATP is broken down, and that's what pulls the actin filaments closer together. And that's when a muscle is contracting. Just as long as calcium and ATP are present, that muscle's going to keep right on contracting.